Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Boston Public Library, welcome to the Central Library and this year's exciting Lowell Lecture Series, Revolutionary Ideas. So now I'm pleased to introduce tonight's acclaimed speaker. In his latest work, The Quartet, orchestrating the Second American Revolution, he gives a gripping and dramatic portrait of one of the most crucial and misconstrued periods in American history, the years between the end of the revolution and the formation of the federal government. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Joseph Ellis to Boston Public Library. <clears throat> Thank you for that gracious introduction. It's um, a real pleasure to be in these halls, which are truly hallowed. Um, I came here to do research many years ago on Adams and let it be known in this House of Adams that I am an Adams fan. When asked who among the founders I would want to have a beer with, I've always said John Adams, that is have a Sam Adams beer with John Adams. Um, up in, up somewhere up there, there's a place where they keep Adams' library and um, and I used it to write a, a chapter in a book called Passionate Sage about John Adams and, um, and argued that the marginalia in those books up there is the clearest statement of Adams' political philosophy. You know, he, he loved to argue and he was a contrarian. Anyway, Zoltan Harasti, who was a distinguished member of the staff here back then, is the one who was responsible for all that. There are difficult times here at the library now and I think everybody that cares about the library would suggest that this event ought to go on in the venerable way that it always has, with a commitment to books and to ideas and for vigorous discussion about them. And that's what I hope to provide for you this evening or whenever late this afternoon, whatever this is. Um, I'm going to talk to you. I'm not going to read to you. Um, and I'm going to take 20 minutes and then, I mean, excuse me, 40 minutes and, and allow 20 minutes for questions. I'm an old teacher. I prefer the seminar format. As soon as we can get to some questions and answers, the more, uh, the more interesting it will be. One of the arguments you'll hear me making is that the Constitution itself is a framework that does not provide answers. It provides only arenas in which people can argue. The ultimate answer is argument. And this makes the Constitution analogous to history itself, which is an argument without end. And so I hope we can continue in that particular tradition. For the vast the majority of Americans, well, for the vast majority of Americans, American history is, a, is its, its entirety is a, is a black hole or a dead zone, but even for very well-read students of American history, the 1780s is, well, somehow we come together to declare <clears throat> and win independence from Great Britain in 76 and then in 81, 83, Yorktown 81, 83, Treaty of Paris. And then we come together again uh, in the same place in Philadelphia and declare our nationhood. And abracadabra, you go from 1776 to 1787, from the Declaration to the Constitution. <clears throat> now, I'm going to tell you that that's not true. And there's a reason why you think it's true, apart from sheer ignorance. Um, some very smart people thought it was true, among whom one is Abraham Lincoln. What is the most famous speech in American history? If we were younger, some of you would say, no, 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 no. <laughs> Don't start. I want to do that in a second. But if we were younger and you had another speech to choose, what would it be? Washington's farewell was not a speech. <laughs> and that's for really old people to believe that. <laughs> Washington never delivered the address. For that matter, he didn't even write it. Hamilton wrote it. And um, what, yes, sir? Huh? 
That's a good one, Kennedy's inaugural. Although if you read it over now, we will not pay any price and pay any, you know, we really don't want to do that anymore. Who's, who had their hand up over there? Lincoln's, that's a very smart guy's one. Historians will pick that one. That's the most poignant one of all. Um, I'm thinking of something in the 60s. You got it. I have a green speech. Um, that's the one that people under 40 or 30 will pick, okay? But, Gettysburg Address, first sentence. Let's say it. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation. Stop it there. No, they didn't. They brought forth a confederation of sovereign states provisionally united to win the war together and then go their separate ways, which is precisely what they did. Why did Lincoln lie? Actually, he didn't lie. Why didn't Lincoln revise history? Why did he have to revise history? If he was historically correct about assessing the meaning of 76, the Confederacy had a legitimate right to secede. Got it? The Confederacy had a better constitutional argument than Lincoln about the history if you go back to 76. If you go to 87, 88, so if he said three score and something else, it becomes more problematic. It's still not completely clear. It doesn't get clear. It's not solved in the courts. It's solved on the Civil War battlefields. 632,000 people die in order to have Lincoln's vision win the argument. But because that vision is well established, especially in the North, if we were speaking in Mississippi, they'd get this right away, let me tell you. Um, we do not understand the extraordinary importance of the 1780s. Because if I'm right, and it's state-based, and listen, listen, to confirm this, and I'm not making this up, okay? This, what was the provision in which they declared independence on July 2nd? This is the real statement that they voted on, the resolution. It comes from the Virginia delegation written by Richard Henry Lee. It says, these colonies are and have every right to be free and independent states. We got another smart guy up here in the front row. <laughs> I mean smart in a real good sense. These colonies are and have every right to be free and independent states. States. The states are rebelling. When they set up a government, and they call it the Articles of Confederation, where does sovereignty lie? In the states. During the war, when Washington asks for money and men from the states, what happens? They doesn't, it doesn't happen. Washington wanted a continental army of between 80 and 100,000. Washington said, Demographically, we have a population, a male population between 18 and 40, that could field an army of 200,000. All I'm asking for is less than half that. The Continental Army was never larger than 15,000, and it averaged 12,000. Why? The states wouldn't do it, because the states were protecting themselves. They were funding militia rather than, federal, than a federal army. This includes Massachusetts, which among the states was one of the most nationalistic. So um, during the early 1780s, after the war ends, the Continental Army hasn't been paid in two years. The soldiers fighting under Nathaniel Green in the Southern Campaign are going into battle with loincloths. Pensions promised to the Army 
are not going to get paid. This is a disgrace. This is one of the biggest disgraces in American history. These guys who stayed the course and fought the war are sent home as beggars because they don't want to, the states won't pay. We have a $40 million debt. Nobody will give us credit in the European markets because we're a banana republic. There's no way to pay off the debt. Each state will take care of its own debts. It won't take care of the national debt. We have 13 different versions of American foreign policy. Massachusetts has separate treaties with Parliament on trade matters from every other state. You can't run a nation this way. And guess what? Nobody cared because they didn't think they were a nation. The average American was born, grew up, lived out their lives, and died within a 28-mile radius. They didn't think nationally. Abigail Adams never traveled further than um, Boston until she left on a ship to be with her husband in 17, what, 1784 to go to Paris. And that's Abigail. Okay, So that distance made a difference. And we, living in an era of cell phones and Skype and everything else, I, you, know, you can tell I'm an undergraduate teacher. I'm used to talking to people 18 to 22 years of age. We need to recognize that this is a, fun, this is a foreign country here. It speaks its own language, and it's different. And it's not an, it is not an emerging nation. It is headed towards a version of the European Union the Europeanization of the North American continent. That's where it's headed. That's where history's headed in the 1780s. And since Lincoln's wrong, and that nationalism is not embedded in the, in the moment of birth, and it's headed in the wrong direction, and nobody cares, how does it change? How do we get to 1787-88. This interpretation is a story that I'm trying to tell that you will have never heard before. Now, it's hiding in plain sight, and there are reasons why it, it's not being noticed, because most American historians are studying other things. They're looking at Peripheral figures, that's their phrase, women, Native Americans, African Americans, the central political narrative isn't their concern. As I was saying to one person here, it's like the, the Malaysian airliner is down and they're searching in a part of the Indian Ocean and I'm over here looking somewhere else, okay? And I happen to be right. Um, it's also the case that the interpretation that I'm offering is not popular in a democratic culture because my interpretation is top down, not bottom up. An elite makes this happen. Get used to it. There are actually plenty of other moments when similar elites function in American history. The revolution itself, that is the war, you could argue I mean, the, the resistance against Britain and then the war, you could say that's bottom up. There is a lot of that, although I would argue in many places, including Boston, the mobs are led by elites and controlled and managed by them. That said, there's a lot at stake here in this particular interpretation and in the factual 1780s experience itself because, question, Is the American Revolution a revolution? If you judge it by a standard political science definition, it's not. The political science definition, as if it's a single thing, it's more than complicated, is rooted in a look at the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, and the Chinese Revolution. It's quasi-Marxist. It believes that class is the big thing, and you have to have one class replacing another class. If that's your definition of revolution, the American Revolution is not a revolution. 
Well, how about the fact that we want a, co a war for colonial independence? That's a good thing, and it was one of the first times it happened. It happens about 50 or 100 times later in Latin America, Asia, and um, Africa, and it's not a revolution. It's a war for colonial independence. That's different. Well then, is there any way to make the case that the events of the 1760s and 70s and 80s are a revolution? Yes, and I'm just the guy to do it with the help of a few people. Um, who's the woman who wrote On Totalitarianism? Hannah Arendt. Hannah Arendt and I are in agreement and I feel really good about being in, in cahoots with her. What makes the American Revolution a revolution? What makes the Constitution a completion of the revolution? Some earlier people would say it's a repudiation of the revolution. I'm saying it's a completion of the revolution. What makes the American Revolution a revolution is the creation of a Republican nation state that becomes the model for the liberal state in the modern world. Got that? That is a revolution. That's what makes it that. And that means if you kind of talk about the revolution, you got to say there are two foundings, one in 76 for independence, one in 87, 88 for nationhood, and you need both of them to have the American Revolution. That's what I'm arguing. This changes the chronology of things. It's great. All the textbooks will have to change. I can make millions of dollars. And <laughs> All right, how does this happen? There are four, there's a leadership group that does this. And at the top of the leadership group are four people, three of whom are very familiar. George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and then one that's not so familiar, John Jay. We have a criminal justice college named after John Jay and because he's the first chief justice. Also, if you go to the CIA building in McLean, there is a conference room called the John Jay Conference Room because he is the first counterintelligence agent in American history. Spy. That's what he was. If anybody out of here invest in the stock market, there's not a single person that invests in the stock market. <laughs> if you have a retirement account, you are investing in the stock market. Go long on John Jay. Jay's reputation is going to go up. And I'll tell you why in a second, but this is part of a general explanation for wh what they do to achieve this. It's August 2nd, 1782. Jay is in Paris, actually Versailles. He's standing next to a minister from Spain called Aranda, Prince Aranda. I always say Prince Orlando, and then I think it's Disney World. <laughs> and they're huddled over a map. Complicated. The Americans are under strict instructions to sign no treaty that does not include the French. The French have a treaty with Spain, so that means we also have to include the Spanish. This is a binding treaty, a binding instructions. Jay's there because Franklin's got the gout. Adams is up in Amsterdam trying to negotiate with bankers. The other guy to replace Jefferson, who backs out, is a guy called Lawrence, Henry Lawrence, and he's captured on the high seas by the British Navy and thrown in the tower. So it comes to Jay to negotiate or do what he calls the skirmishing business. There is a map on the table. It's the most reliable map on North America, and that's a good thing because they have some maps of North America which make, for example, the Pacific Ocean about 150 miles west of the Alleghenies, okay? It's like the New Yorker map, you know? And <laughs> so the Spanish minister points to a place on Lake Erie and draws a line through Toledo, what is now Toledo, Ohio, south to Tallahassee, Florida. And he says, everything east of that line is yours and everything west of that line is ours. Jay doesn't need to draw a line. He points to the Mississippi. He says, everything east of that is ours and it is non-negotiable. Yikes. That wins out. 
The Treaty of 1783, well, Jay goes back to the quarters with, with uh, Franklin. He throws his clay pipe in the, in the fireplace and says, thus we must break our instructions from the Congress. That is, we're under instructions to do nothing without the French. We're going to sign a separate treaty, which is what they do. Have you ever seen the picture by um, uh, Benjamin West? It's called the Treaty of Paris. And in the picture, there's this blank spot, right? It's, a, it's weird, right? Why is there a blank spot? Because the British delegation doesn't show up because they don't want to be memorialized for having lost the British Empire in North America. So they don't show up, but they did. This is a big deal because think about it. When the war is, when you're fighting a war and heading towards independence, who's saying, we need to fight this war in order to win the transmontane West? Nobody. We're fighting this war for principle for, and for denying the parliament's right to tax us, and the principle is more important than the tax itself. But all of a sudden, we get this empire. Now, can a confederation govern an empire? No. Georgia's got its own interests down there. New York's got its own interests. Virginia has got, you know, wants Kentucky not to secede. It's all kinds of crazy stuff. So that once that is acquired in the treaty, it changes the political chemistry. And it's one of the reasons my four guys, the quartet, think we've got to go to a stronger federal government. Another key player is Washington. Washington, you'll recall, surrenders his sword at Annapolis at the end of the war in a very symbolic scene. By the way, this is a sign of how screwed up the, con the Confederation Congress is. Like, the Confederation Congress has moved from, like, Philadelphia to Princeton to Trenton to Annapolis going to move back to just like a traveling road show and they have trouble with a quorum and when the treaty comes to be signed there's not a quorum to sign it and like who's going to sign it when Washington wants to surrender his sword they don't have a quorum in Annapolis to accept it and so they pretend it's nine and it really isn't It is really important to Washington to be regarded as the American Cincinnatus, as the man who surrenders his sword and turns it into a plowshare, retires to his vine and fig tree at Mount Vernon. And one thing about Cincinnatus, Cincinnatus can never come back. You can't unretire. So when they come to him and they say, they being Madison, Jay, and Hamilton, the other members of the quartet, and say, the only way we can make this convention succeed is if you come. And you will immediately be elected president of the convention. And if it succeeds, you'll be elected president of the United States. And he says, that's the last reason I would ever, that's the reason I don't want to do it. No person who becomes president in American history did not want to be president more than George Washington. You know, I've been on a book tour talking about this stuff during the time that all these people are announcing for the, mostly for the Republican nomination. And it's really a joke, you know? Like, I know that I am most qualified to be the president of the United States for the following three reasons. Well, let's, nobody in the world is qualified, qualified to be president of the United States. It's an impossible job. And I would add, nobody in his or her right mind would want to do it. I believe that you have to be slightly crazy to do this, that there is, in other words, there's a kind of natural selection process that nutty people are going to end up being president of the United States in the current crime. I am serious about this. And in Washington's day, if you said, I believe that I am the most qualified, that was prima facie evidence that you were unqualified. 
because anybody that said that was ambitious, arrogant, and therefore not trustworthy in the use of power. Forget such a creature. It's a different time. I know, and we can't go back. But I tell them on the road, no person in the 18th and early 19th century who was president from the first up through John Quincy, well, maybe Jackson, would ever run for president under the current conditions in the United States. Nobody. Um, okay. There's another thing about Washington. He thinks he's going to die. He's 52 in 1784, and he writes this letter to Lafayette and says, the last time I'll see you, I am sliding down, gliding down the stream of life. And he liked that phrase. Slowly to enter the mansion, the, the dark mansion of my fathers. Washington didn't believe he was going anywhere when he died, but into the ground. He didn't believe there was life in the hereafter. He left explicit instructions in his will not to bury him for three days because he thought Jesus was buried alive and really didn't come up from the dead. He just, you know, emerged. Didn't know that. Yeah, it's interesting. And, um, but he wants to live out whatever time, and no male member of the Washington line has lived past 57 in 100 years. So he figures, I've only got five years left. I don't want to do this. So you really got to persuade this guy. And they do. Now this, the argument that wins out is we got a real shot. We could do it with you. Without you, we don't. And if we do it, your legacy is forever. The first time anybody talks about father of his country is when Henry Knox says, if you do it and it succeeds, you will be known as the father of your country. Henry Knox is his old artillery guy. Okay. What do these guys do in toto? They force a calling of the convention. They recruit Washington to the task, which legitimizes it. They set the radical agenda. Washington says, I will not come unless you, Madison, promise me that we will not rest with reform of the articles. We will only rest with a full wholesale replacement. Their instructions are for reform. If they do the other thing, the radical thing, they're violating their mandate. Washington's saying, that's the only way I'm coming. And if we fail, we fail. We fail at a noble cause. Better to fail than to succeed in what in the end will not make any difference. Madison, in the Virginia plan, drawn up right before the convention, sets the radical agenda. They lose a lot of battles in the convention itself because it's impossible for one faction to get what it, wa what it's, what it wants. There are two factions, there are three factions, really. People who want no change in the Confederation, and they boycott the convention. The people who want moderate change, revision of the articles, and the people who want radical change, totally new government. Pretty equal though the small states favor the Confederacy model for obvious reasons. That, and under the Confederacy model, Rhode Island has the same power as Virginia. Anyway, in the ratification process, they attempt to man manage it behind the lines, and they write the Federalist Papers. The authors of the Federalist Papers are Hamilton, he wrote 51, um, Madison, who wrote 29, and Jay wrote five. Jay would have written more, but he, he got sick, and he was, he was hitting the head with a rock because he was trying to stop a mob from attacking the medical school in New York. There was, the mob was thinking that something was wrong because they, they were opening up cadavers, like, and they didn't understand cadavers were already dead. And um, anyway, he got hit in the head by a rock. I tell you, this guy, Jay, he's really impressive in, in the... When Washington becomes president, the first guy he goes to to Jet is Jay. And he says, what position in the cabinet do you want? You have any one. 
and everybody thinks he's going to pick uh, Secretary of State. And he says, no, I want to be Chief Justice and because I want to stay home with my wife. And, um, and so that's what they name him. Um, okay. And then after ratification, and that, if anyone wants to ask a question about ratification, I'll answer it. There's a single book on ratification that came out two or three years ago by a friend of this institution named Pauline Mayer, and I dedicate the book to her. If you want a state-by-state -state <coughs> analysis of what's going on, that's the book for you called Ratification. I got a chapter on it, and here's my take. Pauline does the trees. I'm trying to do the forest. And both are necessary. Every state's different. That's what's interesting. They, every state's driven by local, county, and at most state-based interests. They cannot have a national conversation. Patrick Henry, Virginia Constitution, the ratifying convention, this is really revealing. Opposing the Constitution. What happens if Virginia agrees to this and we send our representatives, say we have six representatives in the House, two representatives in the Senate, and all of Virginia's representatives vote against a tax and it passes anyway? Then we are being taxed without our consent. They think, see, he thinks Massachusetts is a foreign country. Now, does this have a familiar ring to you? <laughs> this is the Tea Party. This is the origins of the Tea Party. And the origins of the Tea Party are not the guys that threw the tea in the Boston Bay, because remember, they're protesting Parliament's taxation, and they have no representation in Parliament. The anti-federalists are objecting to the Constitution even though they're represented because they can be outvoted because for them, any big government, government is not us. Government is them, okay? It's a long tradition and it's gonna be used in the 19th century to defend slavery and the beginning of the 20th century to defend segregation and so it doesn't have a particularly noble history. Um, but now it's being used to you know, essentially allow a minority to oppose, successfully block legislation by a majority. You can see where my own prejudices lie. There's also one other thing I wanna mention that, and maybe if I keep my promise, this will oh, then lead to some Q&A. Madison plays if you were talking about the quartet as a singing group, he would be the lead singer, okay? If it's a musician's group, I don't know enough to be able to tell you bass, I mean, you know, you know lead violin, um, but um, <coughs> it's possible to argue that Madison's not the father of the Constitution because nobody is, because it's a series of compromises in which nobody gets what they want. But actually, there's a guy called Governor Morris. You ever hear of Governor Morris? Governor, some people have, some people haven't. Governor Morris is this guy who speaks more often than Madison at the convention, rises to speak, and he has the single most poignant anti-slavery speeches of anybody. He's really good. He's peg-legged. He's also a real ladies' man despite his peg leg. And if you ever go to the Richmond, the Virginia capital, and you look out at the Virginia Capitol, there's a statue of Washington. The life mask that, that, for that statue was done by Houdon in, in Mount Vernon. He came all the way over from Paris to do this. But where does he get the torso? Governor Morris. Governor Morris is the same exact size as Washington, six, three and a half. So that's his torso. Not only does he speak a lot, but get this. In mid-August of 87, 1787, they send the draft of the Constitution to a committee of style. 
on that committee is a lot of big names, including Madison and Hamilton, and they all delegate the editorial responsibility to Governor Morris. What I am about to describe to you might very well be the single most important editorial job done in all of American history. And tell me whether you think I have a case here. The draft reads at the beginning, we, the people of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, down the East Coast. He changes it. Why does he change it? Nobody says. We, the people of the United States. The whole point of the argument about sovereignty is solved rhetorically there by one guy. And why didn't anybody say anything? You know, like, holy crap, you know? Like, we've just said something here that implies sovereignty of the people, not the states. Why not? I could try to invent arguments, but I know what the right answer is. You know what it is? They're tired and they want to go home. <laughs> they really, it's like, forget it, man. You know, I'm out of here. And some of them have already gone. And by the way, there are 55 people who attend the convention. There's never a single moment when every one of them's there. Never. A lot of them are coming and going all the time. 38 people sign. Bill of Rights. This is where you could argue that Madison, he should argue. He's, he's the guy that writes the Bill of Rights, and he's the guy. How does he write them? Well, longhand, but <laughs> what does he have on his table? He's got 132 proposed recommended amendments submitted by the state ratifying conventions during the ratification debate. Six states, including Massachusetts, send required or recommended amendments. They want, in many cases, them to be mandatory amendments. In other words, we adopt the Constitution and ratify on the condition that you do these amendments. Madison, sitting back in New York at the Confederation, persuades the Confederation Congress to tell him, you can't do that. It's up or down. You can recommend, but you can't require. This is a big deal, baby. And I don't know why they, some, some places, the guy in Massachusetts who makes this work is Hancock. He comes off illness and he says, let's, let's do it this way. In Massachusetts, we're going to vote. It's going to be a close vote. There's like a seven, seven difference in, or 300 people voting and it's seven difference. He says, we'll vote on the Constitution, yes or no, and then everybody knows that after that, we're going to allow you to vote for recommended amendments. Sam Adams says, oh, okay, well, then I'll go along. I took a pretty good look at several amendments, including the Second Amendment, because I'm interested in recent Supreme Court decisions on that. The decision DC versus Heller is a decision by Mr. Justice Scalia arguing that the Second Amendment is an amendment giving a natural right to bear arms that is almost unlimited. There are certain conditions that a community can used to limit it, but it's almost unlimited. And Scalia is the number one advocate for the doctrine of original intent. So that Scalia claims his opinion is based on what the intent of the framers at, in, uh, who were drafting the, the amendment and ratifying. Well, I just spent several weeks trying to figure out what Madison did, and I told you, on the Second Amendment, how many states recommend amendments that have to do with the right to bear arms. How many states recommend amendments that call for the militia rather than a standing army to be the source of national defense? That's what he's responding to in the Second Amendment. 
He's responding to people who worry that there's going to be a standing army and they want to be assured that that is not the case, that's militia. By the way, during the War of 1812, for example, Massachusetts will not allow its militia to go to Canada in the, you know, to serve. They're going to keep them in the state. They don't want this kind. And so the right to bear arms is clearly a, a derivative right, not a natural right, and derives from service. That's what it said. That's what the Supreme, Court, the Supreme Court's been arguing for 250 years, and they just overturned it. And the irony is it was overturned by somebody who claims to be a devotee of original intent. I think the whole original intent thing is bogus. That, in fact, the original intent of the framers, the only thing the most prominent framers agree on is that they don't want their original intent to be binding. If you actually wanted to claim original intent, wouldn't all judges be historians? They certainly, the, the lawyers don't want that. I mean, they can't possibly want that. And if you look at Article Three of the Constitution defining the judicial power, the original intent of the people writing that was not, specifically not, to permit the Supreme Court to interpret the Constitution. So Scalia, Thomas, by your own judgment, you don't have the right to say anything if you go with original intent. You should stay quiet, recuse yourself. And they're not, they're obviously not going to do that. But the most articulate person on this, and that's where I'll end, is a guy who's not even a um, framer, but he's a pretty prominent and extraordinarily lyrical voice, and that's Jefferson. People kept asking Jefferson what he thought about the framers, and he said this. Some men look at constitutions with sanctimonious reverence and deem them like the Ark of the Covenant, too sacred to be touched. They ascribe to the preceding age a wisdom more than human and suppose what they did to be beyond amendment. I know that age well. I belong to it and labored with it. It deserved well of its country. But I also know that laws and institutions must go hand in hand with the progress of the human mind. As that becomes more developed, more enlightened, as new discoveries are made, new truths discovered, institutions must advance also and keep pace with the times. We might as well require a man to wear still the coat which fitted him as a boy, as civilized society to remain ever under the regime of their barbarous ancestors. Um, I think that, that makes the point as, uh, probably as better than I could. Um, and there are many people at the uh, law school and certainly at the University of Chicago Law School who take the doctrine of original intent quite seriously. I propose we have a serious debate, including historians and ordinary citizens, as to whether it is either ridiculous or simply preposterous. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Boehner's recently confused them as well. The president of the Continental Congress. He's, he's, Hancock is president of the Continental Congress. He's the one who, when we, when we get to the 4th of July, everybody will see this picture. It's original, is hanging in the rotunda of the Capitol of this guy, Hancock, sitting at a desk and five guys coming up to him. And everybody thinks that's the signing ceremony on the 4th. First of all, it's not. It's June 28th, and it's not the signing ceremony because guess what? There is no signing ceremony. The play 1776 is dramatically correct, but historically incorrect. They never sign it together. The most of them sign it on August 2nd. There are people signing it in November, though, because they're coming and going. Actually, Robert Morris is the last guy to sign. This is great. And Morris is the wealthiest guy in America, and he has doubts about this. And he's the last one signed. But you go look, and he writes his at the top. <laughs> you know, like, he's the last one, and he can put his name anywhere on the list. It looks like he's the first, you know? <laughs> it's great. In, if maybe in the, in the Massachusetts ratifying convention, Mar, um, Hancock, who's still a prominent figure in, in, the, in the Commonwealth, um, but not governor any longer, um, uh, is sick. And he makes a kind of dramatic appearance in the convention. And it's at that moment, and they're, they're deadlocked because there's a faction in the convention that wants to vote no because they won't be able to get their amendments in. And he throws his influence behind Yes, we got to go with this. You will be able to register your dissent on these, with these recommended amendments, and trust me. And that's what they do. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. What I say a little bit about whether the, how to describe the Constitution, and there's, there's a progressive school of thought. It's also a sort of Beardian school, that is, Charles Beard. And, and part of what I'm saying is in agreement with what they're saying, in that the, one of the original working titles of this book was not the Quartet. It was American Coup. And see, I'm saying, but we didn't use it because people would misconstrue coup for coup d'etat, and coup d'etat is usually a violent overthrow, and this was nonviolent. But it's close. And that's what they said, the, the beard. Anyway, in response to your question, the Constitution is a pre-democratic document, but not an anti-democratic document. The Constitution established as a republic What's the difference between a republic and a democracy? Well, what's the difference between the people and the public? That's a biggie. Ellis says, having thought through this for 27 or 55 or whatever his number of years, Adam's agreeing with him, the public is the long-term interest of the people, which at any given moment, the people don't understand. Got it? The Constitution rests on a democratic foundation, popular sovereignty, and establishes a series of filterations in which the Swoonish swings and excessive toxic elements of popular opinion are filtered out. And deliberation in lieu of impulse governs the final result. The Constitution is written before the democratic mythology has really developed. That is, in the late 18th century, the word democracy is usually still an epithet. It means mob rule. It means democracy. It means I ain't paying taxes to anybody. Um, it means the whole mythology of the common man. They didn't believe in the common man. 
We want uncommon men, for God's sakes. Common men, you know, it's like, and um, uh, I mean, there were both Jefferson and Adams write to each other in their retirement years and say, can you believe this guy, Andrew Jackson? Like, this is not what we had in mind, you know? John Quincy refuses to go to his address at Harvard when, when he's elected president and he's given this talk at Harvard. John Quincy, he's a barbarian, he calls him a barbarian, which he, if he was an Indian killer, he was a barbarian, sort of. Anyway, um, I don't know what I was responding to, but that's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yes, sir. And then you, sir. Wasn't it true that in uh, ratifying conventions in some states, there was a great distrust of the elite, which is why the delegates, a lot of them, demanded that a Bill of Rights be attached. That's true. Before they were signed. Right. That certainly emphasized that the media for ratification. But That's right. a little bit more about how they finessed that and were able to get people to agree to that. Look, let's take Massachusetts. Well, they were outvoted in, uh, in all the states. Well, they weren't outvoted in New York or North Carolina. Um, both of those states would have gone against ratification. But what happened is the name of the game in the ratification process is get to nine. Once you get to nine, see, and by the way, who made that up? How did they come up with nine? Because the Articles of Confederation say for any amendment, it requires a unanimous vote. Madison did. Let's make it nine. It's like, wow, you know, like, wouldn't it be great if we could do that now? I mean, um, but, the, and then in the ratification process, once you get to nine, then it doesn't make any difference because you've got the states. Now, that's, if Virginia didn't go, it was still going to be a trouble. But North Carolina would have never ratified. Rhode Island would have never ratified. Uh, New York would have never ratified. That's, those are three, pretty clear. In Massachusetts, everybody west of 128 was against it. We've been against you guys for 200 years, for God's sakes, because we're a colony out there, all right? You ever driven by the Quabbin Reservoir, brother? I mean, you know what the Quabbin Reservoir is? It's the source of your water supply. In order to get it, we had to bury five towns in western Massachusetts, or something, maybe four. Four. Thank you. Thank you, sir. But we feel strongly about that. And we travel on Shays Highway out there, you know? And, um, but um, so they would vote against anything that Boston supported. If Boston came out for in favor of Jesus walking across the ocean, they would say, we're against it. <laughs> um, they had, they had economic reasons, too. The irony is Shays' Rebellion becomes a triggering event that prompts many people to think we need a constitutional convention. You see the irony of that? And they use it. Madison thinks it's really, and so does Washington. They don't exaggerate it in, on purpose. They really think 20,000 guys are going to march on Boston. They've only got 1,200, maybe 2,000. They don't, they're not going to march anywhere but on the, the, the uh, armory in Springfield, and eventually they're dispersed. Um, Madison thinks it's part of a conspiracy by the Brits to, to knock Western Mass off, join New Hampshire, and they'll secede from the Union to Canada. That's all out of his mind, you know, he's making all that up. It's, it's not true. Oh, there might have been some spy that, you know, but anyway, the irony is, but you're right. However, what, where I disagree with Pauline, and if she were here, God rest her soul, I would like her to be part of the conversation, and she is a feisty creature. She buys into a kind of neo-progressive, it's aristocracy versus democracy. Any attempt to measure wealth will tell you that the amount of wealth on both sides is about equal. The same way there's no difference between people who are Whigs or, or patriots in the war and people who are loyals economically. It's not 
a class thing. It's local stuff. It's really local stuff. Um, and that's the reason I think it's, instead of talking about the democratic ethos, they wouldn't, and they didn't use that term themselves, it's more a libertarian thing. It's more an anti-government thing. Um, that's where it, I think it leads. We can take at least one more and then we need to escape. Yes, sir. Has there been a good book written on John Jay? Has there been a good book written on John Jay? There has been a good book, not a great book. It's, it's called John Jay. And it came out about six years ago. The hell? It's in a weird press, though. It's like a British press because the guy couldn't get an American publisher. I would describe it, what's the guy's name? Oh, you know, early Alzheimer's. Christ, I'm sorry. But um, if you look up Jay or John Jay, you can find it because there's not there's old 19th century books that are, I don't think are in print anymore. My agent is sitting in the front row. I don't want to say anything to him that's going to be held against me. I might write about him. Yeah, yeah. The thing that's neat about Jay, apart from the fact that he was regarded as a pretty much an equal with the top tier during his time, his the quality of his correspondence. His letters with his wife, Sarah, are the closest thing I've ever read to the Gold Star Abigail John correspondence. They really, it's really impressive. There's also a kind of abiding serenity to Jay, and everybody else is going nuts, you know, like there's the British are out ready to capture him in New York during the war, you know, the, the men on the, the negotiating team in Paris are losing, you know, they don't know what to do. Um, he's being vilified after the Jay Treaty and you know, burned at the stake and all this stuff, or an effigy. It never phases him. He's like, I don't know. But I like his correspondence and um, what happened is that his correspondence was held by Columbia University because a professor there wanted to write the authoritative biography and then he died. And so there's only, they're now being released by UVA Press, three volumes forthcoming, whereas, you know, we got 47 volumes for Adams and all the way down the line. The more we know about him, the higher, invest in Jay. He, now he's not a Boston guy, he's a New York guy, but, uh, but invest in Jay. I want to thank you for listening. Um, and I will tell you one story that, I, that shows you where my real loyalties lie. I've been on the book tour trail. That's a really interesting experience. And, um, and uh, when I flew into uh, San Fran to, excuse me, St. Louis, it was night, and I looked down at Bush Stadium. And, um, and it, it caused me to have a thought, and I shared it with my audience the next day. And I said, I had a dream that the Cardinals are going to go on to win the World Series, but their triumph is going to be stained when it becomes reported, at least, that they deflated the baseballs. <laughs> <laughs> they thought even that was funny, because they hate us out there. They really hate the Patriots. Bye-bye. <laughs>